Thank you so much, church, as we get to sing together with uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts with thanksgiving. We're going to read our text. It's found in the book of Romans, chapter 15. We're going to read verses 14 through 22. Chapter 15 of Romans, verses 14 through 22. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and you can follow on the screen if you so desire to do that. Paul writes, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Alicrium, I think that's right, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. Let's pray together. Father, what a joy it is to be able to come now to uh, this text of Scripture and to see these words from the Apostle Paul. Uh, Father, I pray that you would uh, make these words applicable and encouraging to us. Help us to understand what is written here so that it might be profitable to us, that we understand that your Scripture always is profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and for training in righteousness. So we ask for your help and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alliricum is how you pronounce that word. (laughs) All right, so we are looking now this morning at um, Romans chapter 15. As we have worked our way verse by verse through Romans for over two years now, and we're getting close to the end, and these are the final words of the Apostle Paul in the letter. And they're meaningful words. They're not something that we would just throw away because we've made our way through all the important things that Paul has to say. These are important things that Paul expresses here. And I think what we need to see here and understand is some thoughts in regard to the Great Commission. That is that the gospel is to go to the ends of the earth. And we see that, for example, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Well, the gospel is to be preached at Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And to think that the gospel is to go to the very ends of the earth, and you and I have a part in that, is a high calling. It is a great understanding. And we need to grasp that better this morning. We need to take what the apostle has written here, and we need to understand it, in a way that would motivate us, encourage us, inspire us, if you will, to be bold in our faith, to carry the gospel even to the ends of the earth. I want to remind you, if you will, just hold your place there in Romans and go to Matthew chapter 28, because I want you to see here in these words of the Lord Jesus, those familiar words of commission for you and I as believers to be faithful in the sharing of the gospel. Now, we've got this coming February, it's going to be our privilege, starting next week, in fact, we're going to enter into what we call the Great Commission Month, where we emphasize the Great Commission, particularly as we talked about international missions. And if you'll look in your bulletin, you'll see that on the back side of the note page, you'll see the lineup for this month, the Sundays that we will gather 
And you can see we have a couple of men who are guest speakers who will be here on the, um, the um, 11th with Don Curran. There will be um, a Sunday school of all the adults, and it will be a presentation on Heart Cry Missionary Society, and then he will be preaching in the worship hour. And so I hope you'll come for the Sunday school hour and the worship hour as Heart Cry um, Missionary Society is one of the missions that we have supported for years now, and it just gives us new information, gives us updates, and certainly we have magazines, we have all kinds of ways that we can inform you, but Don is coming, and then the next week, Matt Tomlinson, who you have had before, preach to you, and it's going to be a great month of emphasizing the Great Commission, and so speaking of that, look down with me in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, this is the disciples that are gathered, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, I want you to notice three things very quickly about this that will take us into our text in Romans 15. Number one, notice in verse 18, who has all authority? The Lord Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. And what he has done is commanded us in that authority in verse 19 to go, therefore, and make disciples, implying that we are preaching the gospel faithfully, boldly, courageously. And when someone is converted, when they are transformed by the power of the gospel, they become a disciple. And the first step then is for that disciple to be baptized, which is one of the things that we'll be talking about tonight in the baptism class. And then following baptism, these disciples are then to involve themselves in the teaching that Jesus himself has done all that he has commanded that they might observe it, that they might apply it, that they might use it. That is, these disciples are to be involved in a local church. And that local church is to be faithfully discipling, teaching, encouraging them. And so you see that the gospel going forth has a purpose, that God is carrying out what he has intended from before the foundation of the earth. Now back in chapter 15 of Romans, I want to talk to you from the life of the Apostle Paul, how that you and I need to have, number one, a settled confidence in the transforming or the transformative power of the gospel. We need to have a settled confidence in that. Number two, you and I need to have a humble commendation or a humble recognition of the service that we have in the gospel ministry. And we learn this from seeing Paul's life in his example. And then the last thing we want to see this morning, and this will go pretty quickly, is that you and I must have an ambitious desire, a continuation for the extent of the gospel. That it can't just be about me, but it has to go beyond me, and it goes to the ends of the earth. So let's look at these three points together as we pull them out of these verses. Beginning there in verse 14, I want you to notice this settled confidence in the transformative power of the gospel. So Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you. He's satisfied about these Roman believers. Now remember that we have just gone through three weeks of looking at Paul's encouragement, admonition, and even command concerning the strong brother and the weak brother. He's talked about that in his letter. It took us those three weeks to look at the text together as we made our way from chapter 14, verse 1, to chapter 15, verse 7. And now as we pick it up, we see here that Paul is satisfied. He's, um, he's confident in these Roman believers. Now, it's unusual because remember that what apparently was going on is this sense of um, exclusive uh, division, that the Jews and the Gentiles 
weren't coming together exactly as the gospel should cause them to come together. At that time, this is a, the Jews were involved in the church, the Gentiles were involved in the church, but the gospel's transformative power was being quenched, if you will, by the fact that these believers wouldn't uh, serve and encourage and it help one another. So Paul had to address that. But then he comes right back behind that and he says, I'm confident in you. I have full assurance. I am satisfied about you. And notice his term of endearment, his affection. My brothers, I am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves, he has this confidence that these Roman believers, whether Jew or Gentile, are full of goodness, number one, filled with all knowledge, number two, and (coughs) are able to instruct one another. Three things. Now, it's, it's a little bit strange because Paul's never been to the church at Rome. He knew some of the believers that were attending there because we have a whole list of them in chapter 16, beginning in verse 1 through 16. So how can Paul have this confident assurance that they were filled with goodness? And we think about what that means. That means that they were living a life consistent with what the gospel had done in their life. That is, remember what Galatians 5.22 says, that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. That's what he's referring to. He's not saying that they don't have indwelling sin. He's not saying that they're sinless. He is saying that the gospel has done such a work that there's a goodness about their life. And not only that, but he's not saying that they are full of understanding so that they don't need any more, or they are full of knowledge so that they can't learn any more. He's not saying that. He's just saying that you're filled with the knowledge of all that he, Paul, had been writing about in chapters 1 through 14, and that they could continue to grow in that knowledge. They can continue to gain understanding. But he has confidence that they're filling themselves with knowledge. And not only that, that knowledge then causes them to be able to instruct or teach or admonish or counsel one another. That they can help one another. That they, the believers, and that is for you and I to understand for our purpose today, that we can come alongside one another and we can admonish and we can encourage and we can strengthen and we can counsel one another. We can rebuke and we can help one another. You have the knowledge to do that. You have the goodness to do that. You know why? Because the gospel is powerful enough to change us. He He transforms us. That's why. That's where Paul's confidence is. He's not confident in, in them as a person. He is confident in the power of the gospel to change their life so that they could be filled with goodness, filled with knowledge, and able to admonish or teach or counsel or instruct one another. Listen, we have to have that same confidence in the gospel. We're mealy mouth and afraid and backing off of the gospel because we don't always believe that it can change the vilest of sinners. Sinners. We don't always believe that it can change that wretched heart. We're afraid to say it. We're afraid to preach it. We're afraid to have that conversation with people because we don't really believe that they're going to change anyway. And that's a sad state for a Christian who is supposed to be making disciples, going, therefore, and making disciples. We can't do that if we have no confidence in what we're talking about. We've got to have the assurance, the, the full confidence, the satisfaction that Paul has in these Roman believers because he understood the transformative nature of the gospel. That's number one. Number two, if you and I are going to fulfill the Great Commission, if we're going to be disciple makers and we're going to go, then you and I must have a humble understanding or a humble commendation of service in the gospel ministry. We find this 
in Paul's life in verses 15 through 19 of this text. Look at this. Paul just got through saying that they're filled with goodness, knowledge, they can instruct one another, but in contrast to that, on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God. In other words, Paul is saying, listen, I am an apostle and I've taught you and I've encouraged you. I've instructed you. I've admonished you. I've counseled you boldly on some points. And I think it's a reference to all that he's written in the letter. And he's saying, I've been clear. I've come with my apostolic authority. I've tried to explain these things to you. And it's not because I'm Paul, but it's because of the grace given me by God. I have nothing in it of myself. But he says to not only admonish and boldly remind you, you Roman believers, but to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. See, Paul recognized and knew, and we can see it in other places in his writings. We can see it in uh, Galatians, and we can see it in Acts, where he talks about being a minister to the Gentiles. And notice what he says here. He says, in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that's a lot to unpack. But what Paul is glorying in is the fact that God would call him, that Christ would use him for the opportunity and the privilege to be a minister of the gospel of Christ for God's glory. And it would be as he would understand it, this is Paul speaking, as if he were a priest of the Old Testament order. And the souls that were saved, the Gentile believers that were saved, Paul is saying they're like a fragrant aroma. They're like an offering, a sacrificial offering given to God in which God would be pleased by, accepted. Those Gentile believers, those pagan believers would be accepted as Paul ministered the gospel to them faithfully. And again, as I said, you can read about Paul's ministry and understanding of his ministry to the gospel, uh, to the Gentiles in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, in Galatians chapter 2, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 27. There are other texts that we could go to, but the point is, Paul sees his ministry of sharing the gospel to pagan Gentiles as a priestly service that would please God as souls were brought to saving faith Because the power of the gospel can transform people and that would be then an offering to God for Paul's faithful service. Look at this. An offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable and they are set apart. The work of salvation is done by the Holy Spirit. The last part of verse 16. It's Paul who would be the messenger, the priest, He would be the preacher, which becomes then the metaphor that he uses beginning there in verse 17. He uses the metaphor of a priest in verse 15 and 16. In verse 17, in Christ Jesus then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. He's not saying I'm proud of what I've accomplished. He's not in any way commending himself. He's saying I am proud of of the work of Christ the person and work of Christ, what he has accomplished, and he just allows me to be a part of that work. I am proud that the Spirit of God has worked in such a way through the gospel that lives are transformed. Those lives are then offered up to God as a pleasing sacrifice to God. He he understands that's his ministry. That's his calling. All of his life is about that. Look here in verse 17. Or verse 18, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what God has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. In other words, he says, I'm not speaking or bragging about any other's work. I'm not looking to get in on top of any other's work. 
I'm not judging any other's work critically. I'm saying that I will not speak about anything that I myself might accomplish. I have no strength. I have no ability. I have no talent. I have no gift. Unless it is inspired and used by the Holy Spirit, I'm not looking for anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to do what, Paul? To bring Gentiles to obedience. That is, to obedience in faith. That's what he's glorying in. That's what he understands to be the calling of his life. And look, he's done this in four ways. Look at those little connecting words, by, in your English Standard Version. By, word, that is by his speaking, his preaching, and deed, by his actions, by the the power of signs and wonders, that is by the miracles that God performed through the Apostle Paul to authenticate, to make real the things that he was preaching, the life that he was living. Those were signs and wonders that were done for the purpose of convincing pagans that what Paul was saying was true. We see that. We see it, for example, in the time of the Old Testament in the life of Moses. We see all of those miracles in the time of Moses to attest to the fact that Moses was sent by God and that what God was doing was a, his work. It was a supernatural work. We see it again in the time when Elijah and Elisha, the prophets, are preaching, calling the nation from rebellion and idolatry back to God and God demonstrating in power by signs and wonders that what these men, these prophets were saying was true. He's not saying that this is normative for the Christian life. He's saying that by powers and signs and wonders in my apostolic ministry, and there are no more apostles, by that power, by the power of the Spirit of God, all of these came together so that the gospel could be authenticated, and Paul then was the messenger, the preacher of that. So that from Jerusalem all the way around, to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. That is, a, in a straight line, it's a thousand miles from the place where the gospel started in Jerusalem to where it's gone out in Illyricum. I have fulfilled that ministry. I've not shrunk back from it. I've not wavered in it. I have been faithful to preach it in a priestly row, offering souls up to God, And I've been faithful to do this. And look, we need to have that same kind of humble recognition about the way that God would use us. Because it's not our giftedness, it's not our abilities, it's not our education. It's the fact that you and I would surrender ourselves and allow the Spirit of God to work in us and through us so that we might go forth boldly preaching and speaking the gospel in such a way that lives would be changed. I read a quote this week from G. Campbell Morgan. He was a preacher, old preacher. Uh, He was a toddler at the end of the Civil War. He lived through World War I, and he died at the end of World War II. So he saw, saw a lot of war, but he preached faithfully the gospel. And here's what he says about this idea that we're looking at now of a humble commendation of service. What a radiant light this sheds on all our evangelistic and pastoral effort. Every soul won by preaching the gospel is not only brought into a place of safety and of blessing, he or she is an offering to God, a gift which gives him, that is God, satisfaction, the very offering he is seeking. Every so carefully and patiently instructed in the things of Christ and so made conformable to Christ's likeness is a soul to whom the Father takes pleasure. This we labor, not only for the saving of men, but for the satisfying of the heart of God. This is a most powerful motive. And this is what Paul is saying here. Now, I know that in verse 17, he talks about 
of the things as they pertain to God, his work. Then verse 16 and 17, the things that pertain to God, I will not venture to brag. I'm not seeking anybody else's work. I'm not looking for any praise from man. This is the attitude that Paul has. It's an attitude of humble commendation for his service in the gospel. He's privileged to be able to do that. And now finally, let's go to our third point that Paul is making from the text that will help us. Remember that we must have a settled confidence in the transformative nature of the gospel if we're going to boldly go forth, if we're going to send others, if we're going to participate by giving of our wealth to other people to go forth and to share the gospel in, in places that we won't go or the places we can't go. We have to have a sure confidence, a satisfaction, you will, if you will, of the power of the gospel. Secondly, we must understand our place, our role. We, anytime that you and I participate with the Spirit of God to bring someone to saving faith by our willingness to share and the Spirit of God working in that life, is that it is as if we are bringing before God as a priest We're bringing before God a gift, a sacrifice that is acceptable to him, that he is pleased by. Not so that we can get some glory, but so that the gospel can be um, elevated and that the glory of God can be seen in the saving of a lost soul and in the use of one who's been transformed by the gospel. So let's look at this third piece of this in verses 20, 21, and 22. And that is an ambitious continuation. This is what we must have. An ambitious desire or continuation for the extent of the gospel. Look at this. So Paul comes out of his humble commendation for his service in the gospel ministry. And he says, and thus I make it my ambition. Thus I make it my aim. Thus, I make it my goal. It is my desire to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. In other words, he wants to go where no one else has gone with the gospel. He has exhausted the area he feels, that thousand-mile radius, if you will, from the starting point of the gospel in Jerusalem. He's exhausted that. He's ready to go to new places. There's an urgency. There's a desire. It's my ambition. It's my aim. It's my purpose in life. It's my goal. That to go share the gospel. And if we can't go, we help others go. We support them financially. We do it through prayer. Any way that we can so that the gospel might go to the ends of the earth. And Paul uses a quote from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15. Those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. I mean, it's amazing. Paul uses that quote right at the end of Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15, because you know what comes next? Isaiah chapter 53. And you know what Isaiah chapter 53 is? I mean, it's probably the most clear of any Old Testament and perhaps any text in the Scripture of the nature of the gospel. Listen to this. I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. Listen. For that which he has not been told them, they see... And that which they have not heard, they understand. That's the gospel. That's what he just quoted. He quoted that. Then he goes on in chapter 53, Isaiah, Who has believed what he has heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. He had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. 
But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like a shepherd have gone astray, or like sheep have gone astray. We all have turned every one to his own way, that the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the gospel that Paul preached. This is why he says in our text in Romans chapter 15, verse 21, he anchors his going, his ministry, his ambition in the very reality of the gospel. And look, here's two things that I want you to see about this. First, Paul never shrank back from his desire to go to places where the gospel had never preached. That was where he wanted to go. And you're going to see as we come through the end of this letter that Paul's desire was to go to Rome, visit them there, stay for mutual encouragement with one another, and then go to Spain. That was his plan. That's what he desired. His ambition, his aim was to do that. Now, um, some scholars would say that he was able to do that uh, before he was martyred. Others said that he was martyred before he left to go to Spain. But whatever the timetable is, that was his aim. That was his desire. And we can see that the pattern of Paul's ministry traced all the way through the book of Acts as he went to Gentile village after Gentile village. He went to places where the gospel had never been preached. He went with courage and boldness. And it was never easy. It was, it was always difficult, it seemed. He was always rejected, always hounded. Even the Jewish brethren who hated Paul always were opposing him. And it's not that every missionary should do the work that Paul did to go to other places where the gospel hasn't been preached. Because some missionaries would go and strengthen the new believers. Some missionaries would go and cause local churches to spring up and bring the gospel and the teaching and the ramifications of the gospel to the lives of those new believers. But this pattern is certainly one that we need to Take note of. That is that people need to go. People need to be sent. When they're called, people need to be sent to new places where they can hear the gospel that they've never heard it before. And we can participate with that. And the second thing I want you to see is, as I said just a moment ago, this calling that Paul has is grounded in the Old Testament understanding and presentation of the substitutionary work of Christ. It's grounded in the reality of the gospel. And so as you and I would come alongside others, and as they share the gospel, and souls are changed by the power of the gospel because it is transformative. And so look, if you're here this morning, let me just mention this in parenthesis. If you're here this morning, and you say that you're a believer, and your life has not been transformed, your attitudes, your actions, your thoughts, your deeds are no different than your neighbor or your friend who is truly not a believer. You can say that you're a believer, but has has it transformed you? Has it changed you? Has it changed your priorities? Has it changed your desires? Has it given you a heart for lost people? Do you have a missionary heart for God's Gospel to go forth and change people's lives. Paul grounded his aim, his desire. Paul understood, look, he is prophetically fulfilling the Old Testament by preaching the gospel. He is prophetically doing that. And here's what I would say to you. You and I are also fulfilling that prophecy. It it may not be exactly as Paul is doing, I'm just saying that there's a story of redemption that God has that is in continuing um, work to the ends of the earth, to the end of time. And you and I can be a part of that story. And we can do it right here in this local church. We can do it in Raines County or wherever your neighborhood is, wherever you reside, or you can help others do it in India or Indonesia or in northern India, in the Kashmir Valley, wherever it is, we can have a part in the continuation of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. So let's bring this now to a close. And let's do it in this way. Here's three points of application. 
for you and I as believers. Number one, listen, we are challenged from this text. We are challenged to remember that the gospel does change lives. I know it's easy to be discouraged. I know that you prayed for many for years, perhaps one or two that you prayed for for 10, 20, 15, 25, 30 years, and nothing's happened. But I'm just telling you, if, the, if, the, it, if it ever happens, if they believe, then their life can be changed by the power of the gospel. Let's don't give up on that. Let's be confident in that. Let's be assured we can't be lazy, we can't be indifferent, we can't be cynical, we can't be full of doubt. The power of the gospel does change lives. That's why we have to go to the ends of the earth. Here's a second application for you as a believer. We can be motivated, compelled, if you will, to preach the gospel um, by our understanding that when a soul is saved, it's a fragrant sacrifice to God. It's a soothing aroma to God. Every soul that you participate in and who comes to saving faith, it's as if you're offering a priestly service, a sacrifice to God. And a third application then for the believer is that we need to understand our place in history. I mean, look, it's not that you're just here to live the American dream, get your retirement, have a few beach vacations, go on a few cruises, and you die. If that is all that life is, we should be pitied. We should be pitied if that's all that it is. But we are part of a great story of redemption where God is saving souls from hell. And you and I get to be a part of that. And whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, if you do it as a teacher, if you do it as a business owner, if you do it as a student, if you do it as an employee, whatever it is that you do, do it for the glory of God, for the sake of the gospel. That's it. That's it. You don't have to go to India, but let's support those who do. And you and I be faithful to preach the gospel, to live the gospel, where whatever we do, if we sweep streets, let's do it all to the glory of God for the sake of the gospel. The souls are saved. Now, for the unbeliever, let me give you one application. Um, you learn from this text that we just walked through that God has done and is doing everything for necessary for your salvation. He's done it. He continues to do it. And apart from savingly belief, believing in Christ, you will die in your sins. You will die in your sins. And if you die in your sins, you will be damned forever. So you must repent. There's no hope apart from repenting and faith in Christ. You must believe. Why do you think I would stand up here for all this time and present the power of the gospel and try to get us as believers to be encouraged by that and to live in that and to go forward to the ends of the earth in that is because the power of the gospel will change your life. Would you be saved? Would you be saved? Right after the service, when we get done with this table, I'll be back in the back. I will share with you from the Scripture how you can save your life and be forgiven of all your sins and be accepted on the basis of Christ's substitutionary death for you. Would you be saved? That brings us now to the Lord's Supper. Because if we are saved and we understand the nature of the gospel and we delight in the fact that God would call us and gift us and use us to go to the extent of the earth, then we come to this table with joy. We come with thanksgiving. What a privilege it is. And look, what this table does, it allows us to come together and be unified around the gospel. And so, if you're unbelieving this morning, this is not for you. Not that we want to be exclusive or not that we condemn you. It, the, the, the word says clearly that the taking of the gospel for the believer, is for the believer only. Uh, it's a picture for the lost person to see the gospel. And so picture that. 
see that Christ would give his body and shed his blood for sinners. That's the death that you and I deserve. And he took it for those who would believe. And so if you're a believer, this is a time of joy. It's a time to recognize God's faithfulness, God's goodness, God's gifting, God's calling. If you're an unbeliever, please let this cup and the uh, bread pass. Um, If you're a member of another church and you're here this morning and you're not a member of this church, and at that church you hear the same gospel preached that you just heard here, then you're welcome to take this supper with us. We're glad for you to do that this morning. And then finally, if you're a member of another church and you're under church discipline, uh, this would not be for you this morning. The Lord's Supper is for believers, members of a local congregation, to recognize the oneness together, their unity together. It's the way that we're brought into fellowship with one another as members. And so to partake of it solidifies that. It encourages that. It helps us understand that. To be excluded from it says that you're not a member. So let's come to this table and let's recognize what a joy, what a privilege it is to be able to do that.